Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, well, first, I want to welcome everybody here uh, to tonight's program. Uh, we're really happy to have James Sullivan here to talk about his book, Unsinkable. Um, just a short introduction for James. James uh, was born and raised right here in Quincy, Massachusetts. He graduated from Colby College and received an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop, where he was a teaching writing fellow and was awarded a James Michener Paul Engel Fellowship. He's author of a memoir, Over the Moat, which I was telling him earlier looked like a really, really interesting read. Um, and his journalism has appeared in the New York Times and various National Geographic publications. Currently, he's living outside of Portland, Maine, a few miles from the birthplace of film director John Ford, who steamed into Omaha Beach on the destroyer USS Plunkett. Um, we're very happy to have James here tonight. Before I pass it over to him, though, I do want to um, go ahead and mention to everyone that uh, we have uh, programs all the time here at Thomas Crane Public Library. And the next one is next Monday, and it's the four billion year story of Quincy. So it takes place a little bit before the topic of James' talk. And, and it's a story about the uh, geology and the formation of the earth uh, from present day all the way back. So look forward to that next uh, week. But um, right now, I just want to hand it over to James. James. All right, very good. Well, thank you, Paul. And I'm, I'm happy to be here to have an opportunity to talk to, uh, to a Quincy crowd, all five of us, <laughs> as it were, at the moment. But uh, at any rate, um, um, uh, I, I, as Paul mentioned, I grew up in Quincy um, and uh, I started on Billings Road and then out to Squanum and, uh, and then to Marymount. And uh, I spent a lot of time in the Quincy libraries as a kid out in Squanum. There was a library, a little branch library underneath the, um, the fire station in, uh, um, in Squanum. And then of course, when we lived in Marymount, we had access to the, the great Richardson library um, up the square. It's a, I think the most compelling building in the city is that old Richardson wing of the library. Um, so in many ways, this, this story begins in Quincy because that's where some of the Gallagher's ended up after the war. And before that, my mother's family was in Dorchester and that's, that's where John Gallagher um, had grown up and was from. And John is my grandfather's brother. He's one of the five men at the heart of this story. And he was the, he was the uncle that, that none of us got to know. And this book was an attempt to find him. Um, the cover of the book, it makes it look a lot like um, military history. And there's, there's plenty of that in here, but there's this other narrative thread running through the book that's about a search for someone. And uh, in that way, I think it's, it's family history. And, uh, in truth, all military history can be read as family history because all those characters in a, in a military history there, well, they had a mother and a father and a brother and a sister and family. So sometimes when we tell these big stories about the war, we forget that. And, uh, and that's really where my interest was in this. Um, but before I wade into how I found my way to this story, I'd, I'd like to, to play just a three minute video that'll give you a, snapshot of, of what the book is all about. Let's see if I can uh, click into this here. All right, here it is. On January 21st, 1944, at 1300 hours, deck hands on the USS Plunkett hauled anchor as the crew made preparations to get underway. On the bridge, Captain Ed Burke checked orders that called for his destroyer to proceed to the vanguard of a convoy that included 38 landing craft. In the forward fire room, water tender Jim Phelps lit the number two and number four boilers, readying the ship's power plant. On the highest part of the ship, gunnery officer Ken Brown squeezed through a hatch in the fire control director to join five other men who would manage the ship's battery of five inch guns. And in the number three gun tub, 
John Gallagher leaned over the apron of the 20 millimeter gun he manned at general quarters and looked back into the convoy, wondering which of those landing craft carried his brother Frank, a medic in the Fifth Army who'd be going ashore in the first wave. The sailors on Plunkett rolled hands at getting underway. They'd come into the war at Casablanca more than a year earlier and had been steaming toward the red hot center of it ever since. They'd come under aerial assault for the first time at Jela in Sicily. After 36 straight hours at general quarters, they wrote in their diaries that it was a day they'd never forget. Soon enough, that day would become a day just like any other, and then they would get worse. Well, looks like I've lost the audio portion of this. Uh, this, so I'll just sort of narrate. This is. Um, this is the Savannah, a cruiser that was hit. The Plunkett was there and escorted it out of its, out of um, the- The Maddox went down yeah, with 211 of her crew in that first invasion off Jela. They'd seen the Rowan hit in the Gulf of Salerno and watched her go down with 202 men in less than a minute. More than 200 were killed when a glide bomb barreled through five of Savannah's decks. In October, a German sub torpedoed the destroyer Buck, killing 163, and Plunkett ran at flank speed for two hours to pick up survivors. The depths of this war were tugging at them like a whirlpool, and the bombs were falling closer and closer. What they could not know, as they made fast their anchor on the afternoon of January 21st, and started north from Naples through the Tyrrhenian Sea was that they were steaming toward a rendezvous with the German Luftwaffe, the likes of which no U.S. Navy ship had ever seen or would see through all of World War II. It was to be a battle so savage and so relentless, it was a wonder that any of them would survive. This is that story. All right, so a little bit of technical difficulties, but I, th I think you get the you get the picture. That's the the scope of the book. Um, it tells the story of the ship and, and the five men. And I knew very little of uh, any of this when I was a kid and showing up at family gatherings like this one on Billings Road at the corner of Freeman Street. This image is from 1966. It's the backyard between where my Gallagher grandparents' home and my, my grandmother's sister Artie's was. It was the, one of the backyards and my family used to gather in these huge circles at all these events. And I'd just like to read a little bit from the book. I won't read more than a long paragraph here. It's how the book gets underway and, 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 and really speaks to this, this sort of memory. Um, so the book begins, every year on the 4th of July through the early 1970s, my extended family gathered in the backyard of our house in Quincy, Massachusetts. They came with dented metal coolers, crock pots, and foil covered casserole dishes, and Bermuda shorts and headscarves with webbed lawn chairs and Polaroid cameras from jobs as union pipe coverers, tool and dye mechanics, and subway car drivers, the men, and housework and child rearing, the women. They banged the earwigs out of the aluminum tubes of their lawn chairs, set them in a great circle, and call for the younger kids to fetch cans of Schlitz and Narragansett. My great uncle, Frank Gallagher, used to call for his whiskey with two thick fingers waved overhead as if giving the signal to move out. And some obliging niece or nephew would pour him a neat one from a gang of bottles on our porch. Most of the great uncles like Frank had gone away to World War II, which was a circumstance of personal history so ordinary in that backyard and those languorous afternoons that the details hardly qualified as something to talk about. Little was said, for example, about the shell that blew my grandmother's youngest brother, Eddie Martin, out of a foxhole after he'd waded ashore at Omaha Beach and fought his way into Normandy. 
They recovered Eddie upside down from a tree, good to go for another 30 years, albeit with one leg missing. As a boy, I'd have liked to have heard that story or what it was like for my great uncle Billy Lydon to burst into Bastogne on a tank during the Battle of the Bulge. Billy saw more combat than any of us, my great uncle Leo Mann told me after Billy died, shaking his head over what he knew. Instead, in those days, rather than remember the horror and anguish of what they'd been seen and experienced, they talked about what was funny or improbable. One great uncle most frequently told story, his most frequently told story involved an ice cream machine he dropped when he was trying to transfer it by a haul line um, from his sh supply ship to another Navy vessel. Another great uncle liked to tell about how he tapped an electrical circuit in a colonel's bunker so his crew in the neighboring bunker could also have light. And then there was this time Frank Gallagher slipped from camp and made his way into Naples on a day in January of 1944. So that's that's how the book begins um, with that long paragraph. And um, this picture, I mentioned Billy Lydon. This is Billy here behind the pole uh, who went into Bastogne, something he'd never talked about. Um, not when I was a kid, just wasn't conscious of it. This is Warren Meehan who who dropped that ice cream machine on the hall line in the Pacific. And, um, and uh, you know, like a lot of people in Quincy, these, these men were everywhere um, when we were growing up. You know, they were up and down the street around the corner. Um, and uh, and, and uh, today, uh, you know, the VA says 275 World War II vets are dying every day. It, it won't be long now before, you know, we'll know the name of the last man. Um, so as I said before, you know, I, I think that all military history can be, you know, read in this way or revisited as, as family history. And I would imagine that anyone here on this Zoom call this evening, if he or she looks over his or her shoulder, he's gonna look at an aunt who might've worked at the Four River Shipyard or, um, you know, an uncle who was on Okinawa. And, um, um, uh, you know, some of, some of these people, some of our people, they. They tell their stories, but a lot of them don't. And you know, they, you know, they they leave us their assets and their equities when they when they pass on. But all too often, they're they're buried with their their real treasure, their, their stories. Um, so I made sure uh, to scavenge some of that treasure from from my grandbrother, grandfather's brother Frank Gallagher. And Frank here on the left was one of five Gallagher brothers and two sisters who grew up on Oakton Avenue in Neponset. And uh, four of those Gallagher brothers went away to the war. And when they were overseas, they'd, they looked for each other. And uh, at the end of the summer in 1943, this is September, um, John, uh, this is John Gallagher here on the right, he went, his, his ship, Plunkett, came into Mares El Kaber, which was, a Navy base outside Iran in Algeria. And he found out probably through a Red Cross register that his brother, Frank, who was in the Fifth Army, Frank was a medic in the Fifth Army, that his brother's 52nd Medical Battalion was getting ready for the invasion at Salerno. Now, John had been, had been in the Navy since right after Pearl Harbor. And at the time this picture was taken, um, he'd been in the thick of it all summer uh, during the invasion of Sicily. Um, and now they're getting ready for the, the uh, invasion of the Italian mainland. So, so Frank had yet to see combat when this picture was taken. And John was becoming something of an old hand um, because he was a, a gunner on a 20 millimeter on the, on the plunket. So he wades into this infantry base um, and they pitched two men pup tents on this sandy rock strewn African plain. And, uh, and that setup for Chom was just a, another reminder that, uh, that uh, he made a good decision in the Navy, you know, where you'd get a spring bunk and a head that flowed with seawater and uh, so much better. Um, these <laughs> options were so much better than what Frank had, who's, you know, crawling in and out of these uh, uh, pitiful canvas tents. Um, so uh, we don't have too many of the details on, on what happened um, uh, on that reunion. But no doubt John was able to lord it over him, um, Frank on the ground here and, and, and John in this in the ship. Um, so as I said, John is, is, is somewhat seasoned by then um, because he's been at Jela in Sicily and at Palermo 
Um, there have been leapfrog landings uh, on the north coast of uh, Sicily and shore bombardments. And he's, he's already taken the war to, to mainland Europe and, and Frank is, is still getting ready. So that was their first reunion. Um, they had a second reunion. And, and this was, this second reunion was the substance of a story that was the most famous story in my family, probably the, uh, the most famous story across all the branches of my family and that Frank told um, continuously from the time it happened, I suppose, right up until uh, he died uh, in 2012 at the age of 98. And uh, if you grew up in that family, um, you are, are probably qualified to sit down uh, before one of Ken Burns's cameras and tell the story because we've all heard it so many times from Frank. And it goes a little bit like this. It's, it's January of 1944 now, and Frank um, has now been in the war, um, in the thick of it since Salerno, since the invasion, the first Allied invasion of the European mainland in, in, uh, in September. Um, and now they're trying to, you know, they're trying to get to Rome and they can't because they have got, the Germans have got the big guns on Monte Cassino and the Germans have the Gustav line that has, has cut uh, Italy in half. And the Allies cannot punch through these passes um, because Monte Cassino is just raining down um, uh, ordinance on them. So they're stuck. And, um, and so Winston Churchill, who was ever the man for micromanagement, he comes up with the scheme. He's going to do an end run around um, the Gustav line and around Cas Casino, do another amphibious landing. Um, uh, and, and then they're going to they're gonna take 36,000 Allied troops to shore at Anzio, and they're going to run up to Rome and take, and take Rome. So, so they're, they're massing for the invasion now here in Naples, Italy. This is Mount Vesuvius over here, a volcano that, uh, that has actually just started erupting in March of 44. This was, Vesuvius was the volcano that, uh, that buried Pompeii 2,000 years earlier. Um, and uh, the task force is, is coming together. These are all Navy ships out here in the harbor. This is the, the pier in Naples. They call it a, a mole on the Mediterranean seaboard. Um, this, there's a castle here that you can see, a famous, I think it's called Nuovo Castle, and this is Naples. Now, now Frank is just outside Naples, and, and he's been told um, not to go into Naples. They've told all the servicemen, don't go into Naples because there's typhus in there, but Frank wasn't buying it. And he knew that his brother's ship was likely out here in, 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 in the harbor getting ready for this invasion. And uh, so he, he steals out of camp one morning. He's got a five gallon jerry can, which becomes not empty. It's somewhere along the way. Um, Frank's got it half filled with Italian red wine. He doesn't even have a pass, um, but he's going to get into Naples by hook or by crook. He, he's going to get out and have this reunion with his brother. He, you know, Frank landed on a red hot beach in Salerno and trying to cross the Volturno and the Rapido rivers in, in, uh, in Italy was such that, you know, he knew there was a good chance that something not good was going to happen. He wanted to see his brother one more time. So he gets down into this into Naples, and he goes out to the mole here, um, and the flagship is tied up, the Biscayne is tied up there, the, the, the flagship for this task force, there, there are going to be dozens of Navy ships and landing craft, um, troop transports that are taking the men up about 100 miles uh, to uh, Anzio, and Frank asks this guy up on the, up on the, uh, uh, on, on the Biscayne if, if, his, if, if the Plunkett, the USS Plunkett is in the area, and they, they won't tell him anything for sure, um, but they do confirm that it is in the area. So, you know, Frank knows he can't get out to these boats, this mole. Uh, you can't, you know, launch a boat from the mole, a little one. So he comes back down the mole and he crosses over. It's off screen, but the little neighborhood of Santa Lucia that's kind of famous, um, the, the Italian immigrants to America brought a, a famous song called Santa Lucia. He gets into this little neighborhood and he finds this little stone terrace um, where there are a bunch of wooden uh, boats tied up. And, and now he sees a way to get out to the plunket. Now, I'll let, I'll let Frank tell the rest of the story here. So a little Italian was there at the pier 
I jumped in, I said, roll up, and I have and he yelled on all that, I said, roll up, and God damn, I have and I get out there, and don't you think I saw a buck in Yeah. And I climbed uh-huh. over, ball ships. Climbed over the back of it. Yeah. I, just, I should have been shot dead, I had a can, it could have been a mine or anything. Yeah. You're supposed to, I don't know it's about the Navy, you're supposed to go to the gangplank, walk up, salute the flag, and ask permission to board. Yeah. So then the captain called General Porters, they call it. I, he's Navy trained, I never do. Now, they're all, there's about 250 sailors on a destroyer. They're all up in the bridge and down there. I'm standing in the little car, he's my five gallon can of wine, and he's blasting the shit out of the gun like that. He said, that looks like my truck. <laughs> Oh, well, geez, and he came down the captain was already, his name was Burke. He said, get on and bunk with your brother there. We should find out what we're going to do with you and everything else. So I had beer and everything else. The captain had kept the wine. I didn't eat shit with you. That's bigger than your house of wine. Yeah. Yeah. So they got a red alert, they call it. They were alerted. Now they're going to the invasion. Oh, yeah. And uh, they put me ashore about 11 o'clock at night. So that, that was Frank Gallagher in 1998. I think just from <laughs> just from the way he talks, you get a pretty good sense of uh, of, of of Frank. Um, so that was the story that that he told uh, his whole life, and I think there's a reason he told that story so many times. I I'll revisit that toward the end of the the talk here. Um, so that's 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 what I knew. That's what people in my family knew of, of, about the story between John and Frank. Um, before I get a little more into that, I'll just give you a quick overview on, on, on the Plunkett, just to put that in context. This is a, a U.S. Navy destroyer. In fact, in March of 1940, this is the Plunkett on the cover of Popular Science magazine. Um, it was a, a, a Gleaves class destroyer, um, the most famous class of destroyers during the Second World War, the Fletchers. Um, they were the ones, especially in the Pacific, that uh, you know went up against you know the, the Japanese Navy, the kamikazes, the torpedoes, all that. Um, but the Gleaves class in 1940 was still new. Fletcher's had yet to come online, and the Plunkett was getting its 15 minutes of fame uh, on the cover of this magazine, and it was going to get another 15 minutes of fame um, uh, during the D-Day invasions at Omaha Beach because the film director John Ford who made all those those John Wayne movies and How Green Was My Valley and The Quiet Man. Well, he went in to Normandy on the Plunkett. He was on the ship for a week. And uh, there are some really interesting stories uh, about Ford on the Plunkett. Um, And um, so the Plunkett is, you know, here it is in the cover of a magazine. John Ford is on the ship. Later, if you know the book, The Winds of War by Herman Woke, I was reading that book during the research for this book Unsinkable, and I'm out in my backyard, I'm reading about the main character, Pug Henry, in that book. He gets on a ship, a destroyer, during the Lend-Lease um, swap, the, um, uh, the, the swap uh, destroyers for bases, the United States and Great Britain had come together. Um, we were trying to help the British, and we were giving them more than 50 destroyers, and Pug Henry is on a destroyer. He's on the Plunkett, the USS Plunkett, so the Plunkett is popping up all over the place. It's a destroyer. And if when you think about Navy ships during World War II, um, there were all many different kinds of ships, but there were five principal kinds of ship. There was uh, the destroyer, there, there was the battleship. Um, by World War II, the battleships, they had come and gone. Um, there was the aircraft carrier and the aircraft carrier was a big deal in the Pacific, not so much in the Atlantic. In the Atlantic, the two big kinds of ships were the destroyer and then the destroyer escorts and the cruisers, um, both light and heavy cruisers. Light and heavy depends on how much armament it had. So you've got carriers, battleships, cruisers, destroyers, and submarines. They were the fifth type of ship. And it was the destroyer's job. Um, they were um, you know, sort of the, the, the first ship in harm's way. I always sometimes think of them as like the Minuteman behind the stone wall or the grunt on point in the jungle. It was their job really to do anything and everything. Um, when they were when they came online in the year 1900, they did so um, as a ship that was a, it was a torpedo boat destroyer during the Civil War. 
these torpedo boats uh, had been developed and, and that's um, you know, how they went after the ironclads. So you had to come up with a ship that could get the torpedo boats and that's what the destroyer did. Um, so they were fighting other ships on the surface of the sea. And then when the submarine came into its own, um, well, the Navy developed depth charges so that they could, they could um, fight ships under the sea, threats from under the sea. And then during the, the First World War, that's when the, the era of strategic bombing began. It literally began um, with pilots in open cockpit planes throwing bombs out the open cockpits at whatever was below. Well, that's when destroyers acquired anti-aircraft weaponry. So, so by World War II, you've got a ship that, 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 that is a hunter killer going after submarines that is answering aerial assault with five inch guns, 1.1 inch guns, 20 millimeter guns, and is, is going surface to surface. Although a lot of that didn't happen in the Atlantic, certainly a fair bit happened in the Pacific. So that's the destroyer's job. It's uh, it's screening convoys. It's you know you you've got troop transports and landing craft going in on amphibious landings, or you're taking troops from North Africa um, over to Europe, and you need destroyers to be you know like sheep herding, uh, like sheep herding dogs are on the fringes of that convoy to make sure that nothing gets through. That's that's the destroyer's job. Um, so um, <clears throat> so the Plunkett. Um, was, was that kind of a ship, it was, it was the destroyer. So now it's, it's the spring of 2016 and uh, we're getting back to that story that Frank told his whole life. It, Frank's, Frank's story, it wasn't really a story because it, didn't, it had a beginning and it had a middle and we knew the ultimate outcome of the story but we didn't really know what happened. Um, not in any detail, not in any meaningful way. I think Frank knew, never talked about it. We had the legend, but we didn't have many of the facts. Um, we just had Frank's story. So in the spring of 2016, on the verge of a family trip to Italy, I, I stumbled into Anzio during the planning process. It, it, it had not been a part of the original plan. Uh, Rome was, and I had been hoping to see Pompeii, but Pompeii was a long day trip from Rome. Uh, and as I looked at the map, I thought, well, you know, but then there on the map, I see Anzio. And this is that, that word that is, is, has loomed so large in, in, in my recollection that we'd heard about for so many years. And as soon as I thought we might make a day trip here, I began to wonder whether any of the facts might be available on Frank's story. And, um, you know, going back to John Ford, there was that famous phrase, from the, the Western, the man who shot Liberty Valance. And the phrase is this is, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. And uh, John Ford was talking about the stories of the old West um, with that phrase. And it means simply this, that the, the, the story of what happened is, 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 is better, or if the story of, of what happened is better than what actually happened, um, you know, print, print the legend, tell the story. Um, don't bother with the, the facts of it. Um, so we have the legend and not many facts. Um, but when I found out the facts, it turned into a story that was more incredible and full of more sorrow than any of us could have imagined. And so I began to wonder, are there any men still living who had been on the plunket at Anzio? This is 2016 and you've got to be in your 90s, right? At this point. And so I jump up on the internet and, and pretty soon I'm at a reunion page for the ship's last reunion in 2011. And I find the name of a, of a contact number at the, at, um, at the bottom of the page. This man, Ted Mueller, I think he lives in, I think Ted was living in Illinois and I called him up and, um, and he tells me, um, I tell him I'm interested in the Plunkett. Um, are any men still living who were on the ship at Inzio? And he says, he says, yeah, there's this one man um, this really nice fella uh, named Jim Feltz. He said, I, I think he'll talk to you. And so he gave me his, his phone number, both his phone numbers. He had, Jim had a cell phone too. So I, uh, I called him at home, no answer. I call him on his cell phone and I catch him. He's at a home show. And I think it's just crazy. You know, this guy's 92 years old. He's out walking the aisles of a home show 
you know, as if I don't, you know, shopping for, uh, you know, tile for a new backsplash or something. He's 92 years old. He's not given up. Um, and so I tell him that I'm interested in his ship, the Plunkett. I didn't tell him uh, why right away. I mentioned the name of that ship and he starts talking. He, I, uh, he starts telling me some of what I know he's always talked about uh, with respect to his ship. And we, we go on for about five or six minutes, a little bit of back and forth. He's sort of giving me the broad brush strokes of what the ship, and this is thrilling. This is like, to me, it's living history to, to hear from this man. Um, he's out in St. Louis. Um, and, uh, and so he says, look, I'm, I'm, I'm at this, this show right now, but could you give me a call back tomorrow? I'd love to talk to you then. I said, sure, I'll, I'll give you a call at home. And I said, before I let you go, I just, I'd like to tell you the name of my, my great uncle and I told him John J. Gallagher and and uh, and there's silence on the other end of the phone and I'm listening I'm listening I think the calls dropped I looked I remember looking at the face of my phone to see if the call dropped it hadn't dropped um, and I know I think it went, you know there's 270 men on a destroyer I've just asked this 92 year old man to remember back 70 years do I remember this name maybe he doesn't want to disappoint me but then his voice comes back to me and in his voice, there is a smile as big as the moon. And he says, Johnny Gallagher was a very good buddy of mine. And I thought, wow, now I've, I've, I'm, now, now I've got to do something. Um, you know, in, in my life, there have been maybe three coincidences or surprises. And, and, th and that's one of them, you know, that, that one phone call. So I, I, at this point, all I'm trying to do is satisfy curiosity. I just wanted to find out was, was, you know, were any of those men still around? And so I get to Jim Feltz. And this is Jim. That was Jim as an old man. Um, and, and here's Jim Feltz at, at 18 years old. Um, he grew up in Overland, Missouri. Um, he quit high school in the 10th grade, um, went to work in a five and dime um, on the main street in Overland. And uh, he's a stock boy. He's, he's working there. And in the, in the, let me see, in the spring of 1940, he meets this girl, Betty Niemiller, and it's his first girlfriend. But the deck is stacked against Jim because she was only going out with him as a favor to her aunt, um, who also worked in the Five and Dime, and was only six years older than Betty. Um, and she really liked Jim. The aunt liked him as a kid brother and wanted to introduce him to her niece, who was like her sister. So they, So she gets them together and uh, she's really, I've read a lot of the letters, she <laughs> apologizes to him later for being really mean to him in the beginning. Um, so the stack was stacked against Jim. He, he really liked this girl, Betty Miller, uh, Nee Miller. Her father didn't relish the idea of Betty who was going to secretarial school, um, um, taking up with a stock boy um, who was the son of a crippled man who filled gas tanks at the, the gas tanks at the filling station up at the corner. And uh, but the biggest liability that Jim Feltz had uh, was that he couldn't get a drug, and that's what Betty wanted to do more than anything else. So the deck is really stacked against him. And now here comes the war uh, on Pearl Harbor. He is um, working with a, a floor walker at the Five and Dime. They are getting the windows ready for Christmas when a man comes down the street in a truck with his head stuck out the window, um, yelling about what had happened at Pearl Harbor. And within a couple of months, um, Jim was swept into the war. Um, so, so that's a little bit of Jim's story. And, and I got a taste of that story um, just um, in a couple of phone calls. Again, not, not knowing what any of this was, it was just seemed amazing to me that, uh, that I could, could talk to a, <clears throat> a man like this who, who not only was on the Plunkett, but uh, was a very good friend of this uncle I'd never known. So now I'm, I'm on the phone, um, you know, because uh, I, I'm, I'm frantic now. I'm cognizant of the clock. I know that, you know, the, the clock is ticking on these men. And in many ways, we've, we've said goodbye to the greatest generation, haven't we? I mean, Saving Private Ryan and the Band of Brothers and, to, you know, Tom Brokaw's book. And, and, um, but they were and are still with us. They were in their mid to late 90s. Um, after connecting with Jim, I, I'm up online and I'm looking for other men um, who were on the ship because I got a roster of the reunion book. And I find um, that the captain of the Plunkett is long dead. Um, and I found a, an obituary for a man named Ken Brown, who was the gunnery officer. Uh, that was the name of the gunnery officer on the Plunkett. 
Um, the gunnery officer, also known as the gun boss, he commanded the ship's battery. Um, so he was in charge of all the guns on the plunket. And um, um, I thought, well, you know, here's an obituary. I found some names in there. I thought if I can't speak to the gun boss, boss um, let me try to reach one of his relatives and I can speak to the family. So I called a woman named Karen Brown Frontaro and she calls me back the next day and, and she tells me that, you know, the obituary that I had read was, was not of her father, it was her brother. Her brother had passed away and her father was alive and he was 96 years old and he was living outside Denver. And this is Ken Brown right here. Um, so here's Ken Brown in 1942. He's a recent graduate of the Naval Academy at Annapolis. And before the war was over, he's going to marry this woman in this picture, a woman named Ann Wealthy, who grew up in New York City. Now, Ken, uh, uh, he grew up in Glen Ellen, Illinois. He was the son of a typewriter salesman, and he was the grandson of an immigrant from the north of Ireland. And he didn't have, Ken's story is really interesting. He didn't have any ambitions for the Naval Academy. His father, uh, his father had... Um, uh, seen this movie with Jimmy Stewart and Robert Young called Navy Blue and Gold. And uh, his father got really excited about the possibility of his son going to uh, the Naval Academy. And because Ken's father was politically well-connected, he secured an appointment uh, for his son to the, the Naval Academy. And Ken would say, I, 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 he said, I had no ambitions in that direction. I was just going along, it's my, what my father wanted, and I was just going along for the ride. So, um, so that's how, how Ken ended up um, at the Academy. He's, he was a guy who was more concerned with his cars and good times and jokes. And he just doesn't fit the mold of those men who are as grim as their guns. Um, and uh, um, uh, uh, so he goes to the Naval Academy and, uh, and he drives home uh, to Chicago after graduation. He's supposed to graduate in the spring of 1942, but then there's Pearl Harbor. And, uh, and they, they, they moved the graduation up to December 19th of 1941. So two weeks after Pearl Harbor, um, Annapolis graduates the class of 42 and, and they disperse into the Pacific and, and into the Atlantic. Um, Ken wanted the Atlantic because he thought that's where all the action was going to be. So when he requested his assignment, um, that's where he, uh, that's where they put him. He realized later that he, maybe he made a mistake because he, he wanted action first and foremost. And very quickly after Pearl Harbor, it looked as if the Navy's principal war was going to be in, in the Pacific. And it was. Um, so after the holidays in 42, Ken takes the train across country to Boston and he comes aboard the Plunkett on January 23rd, 1942. And here's another, just another couple of paragraphs from the book. On the morning after Ken Brown reported for duty, 43 apprentice seamen bust into the Navy Yard from the receiving station in downtown Boston. It was a warm afternoon for January with temperatures cresting 50 degrees. A headline on that day's edition of the Boston Daily Globe reported a Japanese move on Australia. Well, the type just below reported uh, the headline, U.S. holds in the Philippines. Ernie Pyle had filed a column from Dakota, Tacoma, Washington that ran in the morning's edition. Ernie hadn't put on his heel helmet yet. And the soon to be legendary war correspondent was reporting from the home front, complaining about how much it costs now to eat bacon and eggs for breakfast. What had been 35 cents was now $1.40. And so Ernie writes, if they don't get me in the February draft, I think I shall go into the bacon and egg business for the duration. So at noon on the ship's bridge, uh, an officer, Jack Simpson, he re relieved Ensign Jack Collingwood from Washington State as officer of the deck and met the recruits with a yeoman in his clipboard. And on they came, the ship moored as before that afternoon, a roll call of names scooped from a cross section of America's ethnic porridge, Jews, Irish, Italians, Germans, Poles, and English, the yeoman scribbling them all down before he typed them up for the ship's deck logs later. There was Bill Alverson from Little Rock and Tom Garner from Philadelphia and Irvin Gephardt from Hawkinson, Delaware, though his first name was mistyped as Twing. Not that it mattered, everyone would come to know Irvin as Dutch. There was Vytold Zakharuski from South Boston, whose name had also been misspelled. No one ever worked at trying to get Zakharuski spelled right or pronounced properly, they just called him Ski. 
On they came, 43 men in all, including John Gallagher. It was January 24th, 1942, as they came aboard, two years to the day and almost to the minute before the klaxon would yank them to battle stations for the sixth time that day off the Italian coast at Anzio. Duchy to the after engine room, Ski to the ship's forward engine room, and Alverson, Garner, and Gallagher to gun tubs on the starboard side of the ship. So, um, so I mentioned Jack Simpson. Um, I'll um, very quickly move through a couple slides here. This is, this is Jack. He was uh, Ken's first roommate on the Plunkett. Um, that was the term that Jack um, used when I first talked to him because I got Jack. Jack was born in 1920. He's 96 years old um, when I caught him. And, and, and Jack's from Atlanta. And uh, he had um, uh, went to work for his father, was a truck farmer right after he graduated from high school in 38, but he was going to night school. And, um, and while he was going to night school, um, the Navy started this program um, where you could, um, you could uh, if you had three years of college, you could uh, come into this new officer training program. And Jack went for it. Um, he jumped on his Harley in Atlanta, and he, he rode that thing all the way from Atlanta to Chicago for training at Northwestern University. It was a, one of those grueling programs. There were 13 candidates, 13 roommates he had bunked in his room. And, uh, you know, the inevitable bad rock, right, luck, right, with 13 of them, six of them failed out. And, uh, and seven came out as officers, including Jack. So he jumps on his Harley and uh, he throttles that thing all the way back to Atlanta. He goes to communication school. And at Pearl Harbor, he's up in Boston. Um, waiting for the Plunkett to come in from a transatlantic convoy. Jack told me he was at his, the first hockey game he'd ever seen um, when Pearl Harbor was struck. An announcement came over the intercom. I, I couldn't confirm whether it was the Bruins. I don't think it was, but any naval, any military personnel were ordered back to their base. So he left the hockey game and uh, he's back now waiting for the Plunkett to come in. So I've got these three men now. I've got Jim Feltz and Ken Brown, and I'm just on the phone with them, talking to them. I've got no designs on a book, although that's starting to, 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 to come to mind um, because what they're telling me, I, I'm thinking is, you know, this, it's not the sort of thing you want forgotten. And the fifth man at the heart of this book is, is Ed Burke, Eddie Burke. Um, he's the, the, the ship's captain at Anzio. And uh, Eddie was also, uh, an Annapolis graduate. Um, he is, um, um, he, he came aboard the Plunkett in 1943, early 1943, um, after having graduated from the Naval Academy um, in, uh, in 1929. And he had captained the Navy team that went down in defeat to Newt Rockney's Fighting Irish. Um, they were known then as the Ramblers uh, at Soldier Field where this picture was taken in 1928. That's Eddie Burke right here. Um, a little bit of the eye of the tiger on him. This guy here for Notre Dame is Miller. And he was a Zion of the, the Miller Brewing Company family. Um, so uh, the, the midshipmen, the, the, the Naval Academy midshipmen weren't gonna beat Newt Rockney this year uh, at this game. Um, and they, they lost um, another major game to Army at the Polar Grounds later that year, but they were otherwise undefeated. Ed Burke is, is one of 13 All-Americans in the history of the U.S. Naval Academy. Um, and not only was the guy the captain of the football team, but he was also a light heavyweight boxer. And uh, he, uh, he made it to uh, the title fight in 1928, in 1929, he lost the light heavyweight title to a, a guy named O'Malley from MIT. So this is this is a guy who's who's you know who's in command of the uh, of the Plunkett at, at Anzio. Um, this is Eddie Burke here on the right. Uh, this is the squadron commander Jim Clay. And on Plunkett, Burke was no nonsense. Um, he was uh, you know he he was the kind of man who would physically move a man out of the way like a chess piece on the bridge if you were in his way. That's what Jack Simpson remembered of uh, Captain Burke on the bridge. Um, he brought, Burke brought boxing gloves onto the plunket. And when the ship was in port at Mares El Kabir or Palermo, he'd, uh, he'd conduct sparring sessions uh, on the fantail, ostensibly as exercise. And he'd say all comers were welcome. Didn't matter 
Many of the men remember Burke on the fantail boxing. And his grandson told me this anecdote, it, uh, how it didn't matter that my grandfather was the CEO and warranted a salute from any of the other white hats on that ship. And he'd pull off his shirt and, and note as much to the men ringed up on the fantail. He'd say, my shirt's off. He'd tell them, come at me and don't hold back. They respected Burke. They knew he was a, 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 an amazing wartime commander. He didn't run a happy ship, um, which is what the previous captain, Lewis Miller, who was here in this, this group picture here. Um, this is Captain Miller. He preceded uh, Burke on the Plunkett. Uh, he ran a happy ship because uh, he made sure that the crew was well fed. Um, and, uh, and, and, and Burke was, was not like that hard bitten, but a great wartime commander. Um, his crew would come to find out and they respected him immensely. Um, so I've got these five men now and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and now it's occurred to me that there's a real story here because they're all telling me what had happened to this ship during the war. And so now I'm, I'm determined to, to go looking for this man who's always been missing from those, those cookouts in the, in the backyards in, in Quincy all those years ago. And I, I know I've, I've, I've somehow got to find John Gallagher among them. And so I begin looking, I'm coming into all kinds of documents and images about the Plunkett, including this one from the Hotel St. George in New York at Christmas in 1942. And uh, this is Jack Simpson here at the front of this picture. And this is Captain Miller. And I'm looking around this picture and, and uh, I zoom in over you know, all the parts of it. And then here's John Gallagher, you know, popped up here in the picture. Um, this man here is Jim McManus from Fall River. And, I, you know, I would bet that Jim McManus is having a really good night in this picture. In fact, in fact, the story is quite remarkable. This, this night at the, at the Hotel St. George, these guys, they ran out of mixers for their whiskey. And at the end of the night, they were so disappointed at, at having to lose Captain Miller that they sent a telegram to Franklin Delano Roosevelt that the, they defied all Navy protocol, right? I mean, they, they called a bellboy up. Jim McManus wrote a memoir, it was unpublished, and he tells the story, and Jack Simpson confirmed it. Um, they had a bellboy come up, or a Western Union guy, one of those um, guys in the pillbox hat comes up, and they sent, they, they put this, this, uh, this plea to, to the president to, they want to keep their captain, they send it down. And they, they, they were all almost bounced out of the Navy for, for having done that. Um, so so that's, that's the men on this ship. And, and as I said early on, the, the, the Plunkett is, is remarkable for a number of different reasons. They were the only Navy ship to be involved in all six invasions in North Africa in Europe during the war. Um, in, in November of 1942, they were in Casablanca. In fact, they were in Casablanca on the very day that the movie, the Humphrey Bogart movie debuted um, uh, in Manhattan. Um, in, in John's work, John Gallagher's work on the, on the ship, he was one of the ship's engineers and he worked in the fire room. There were two fire rooms on Plunkett. And in the fire rooms, that's where the boilers uh, heated the water to create the steam that would drive the ship's turbines. So you would produce the steam in the, in the boilers in the fire room. You would uh, route that steam into the, one of the two engine rooms. And in those engine rooms, they would, uh, there were two propellers um, that drove the ships, um, uh, that drove the ship. And, and that's, that's how it worked. Um, so that's where, where John worked. He worked on the boilers, um, but at, General Quarters, when that sounded, you know, the, the battle station, his battle station was on a 20 millimeter gun on the starboard side of the ship, right beside the second staff. And this is it here. This was Gallagher's gun during the war. Uh, there were three men uh, that worked on this, um, on this gun. Gallagher would shove his shoulders into the, these, um, these uh, shoulder C-shaped shoulder braces. He, there's a little strap that he would strap himself into. Um, there were these sights that they used. Uh, he had a loader and a handler, and the handler would raise the elevation of the gun. Um, uh, the, um, there were all kinds of different angles, and you know the, this thing is on a, a turret, so that it's 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 swinging from side to side. They couldn't go after high flying bombers, but the torpedo bombers 
um, would have to come low. And that's really where the 20 millimeter earned its, uh, uh, earned its day. Um, so there were three men on this ship, on this uh, gun. There were six of these guns. You can see another gun tub up here. And there were two up in the bow and two on the other side of the ship. The ship also had a 1.1 inch gun mount, which was right here. And there were four five inch guns. There's one of them here. There's another one in the, in the, on the fantail. And then there were two in, in the forward. So that's, that's the ship's gun battery. Um, so that's Gallagher's gun there. Um, now, I'll very quickly go through a few slides here and, and, and leave you to perhaps read the rest of the story um, yourself. But the Plunkett, after Casablanca, they came back to the States. Um, and in the spring, they returned to the Mediterranean. And, and this is when the war really heats up for them. Um, the Allies have defeated the Germans in North Africa. And uh, in July of 1943, they make their first move on Europe. They decide to invade Sicily. And it's gonna take 30 days, but they're going to, the allies are going to take uh, um, the island of Sicily before they move on to the mainland. Um, and the first big action for, for Plunkett um, takes place at Jela off the coast of Sicily. And this was the moment they'd been all waiting for. It's more than a year now since many of the men, including Gallagher, Brown and Simpson have, have come aboard the Plunkett and they wanna get into the action. And uh, they, they convoyed into Jela on the south coast of Italy the day after the first uh, wave of landings. And um, it, it had been a, a, a tough landing. Um, the, the, the Luftwaffe had, uh, had landed a, a, a bomb on the, uh, uh, the Maddox, another destroyer, um, and 202 men went down with that ship. Um, they landed another bomb on, the, on, on one of the landing craft. And the, the day Plunkett uh, got in the harbor, the Luftwaffe hit the Robert Rowan, which was a Liberty ship, an ammunition ship. Um, they hit that. And when a Liberty, when an ammunition ship blows up, this is what it looked like. And this is what it looked like from the decks of the Plunkett. So, so they're in now on the invasion of, of Jela. And now they're just going to march right up through the war. It begins for them um, in in. in on July 10th of 1943, they're at, they're at general quarters for 36 straight hours. Several of them wrote that in their diaries. And then it's just a relentless march for the summer and the fall. They're constantly under aerial assault. Um, you have got uh, E-boats, you've got the threats of submarines. Um, the first invasion of, the, of, of Europe didn't happen at Normandy, but at Salerno on the Italian boot. This was in July, uh, September of, of 1943. Um, this was Frank's first uh, invasion of the war. Um, and this is where Plunkett um, takes out its first two German planes um, at Salerno. Um, so um, in, in the Battle of Salerno, the Germans hit this hospital ship. Plunkett goes out um, uh, to, to try to put out this fire and salvage this ship and they don't and they have to sink it. It's, it's like one, one thing after another, all through the fall. The, the, the USS Buck is, is torpedoed and the Plunkett runs at flank speed in, in October of 43 out um, to pick up the survivors of the ship. And it's, um, you know, they, they're in the thick of it now from July, uh, from July on. And on December 7th of, of 1943, it's two years to the day since, since, since Pearl Harbor, and, and uh, John Gallagher is, is writing a letter home. He's over in the Mediterranean. He can't, he can't tell his family anything now. Um, um, you know, the, the Navy censors um, did not cut anything out of this letter, as you can see, because he knew better than to write where he was or what they were doing. Um, but he was a, an incredible, um, he, he, was a, he wrote a lot of letters to the war. And one of the letters I have, he writes about how it was the 17th letter he'd written in a single day. Um, very few of these letters survived. And I didn't have any of them through most of the writing of this book until Frank's daughter was going through some of her late brother's possessions. And she found six letters that John had written to her mother, who was a friend of John's. Um, from the corner, and uh, her mother, Sophie, um, was going to marry Frank after the war, and, and John was friendly with her, and um, he, um, so he writes this letter to, 
to, to, to Sophie. And I'll read just a little bit of it here um, and then maybe wrap things up because we're getting pretty close to our hour here. Um, as I say, he's been under aerial assault all around Sicily and off the coast of Italy. And, uh, and Frank is, is on the ground in Italy. John can't say where, and he lies to Sophie in, in the letter because Frank is in the thick of it. Um, but this is what John writes. He says, I know where Frank is and hope to see him again. I have been there three times already, but we couldn't get liberty then. I think I will be back there before we leave here. And if we stay a while, I should get liberty to see him. He's all right where he is, so don't worry and tell my mother not to also. Gee, I would love to drop in a Costello some night while you're all there. It was just two years ago when I was there with Franny, Hack, George Hurley, Welchie, and a few more of the boys. We decided to join the Navy that afternoon. We went into the post office that night at 12 o'clock to join, and the next morning at 6.30, Franny, George, and myself were ready to go if they wanted us. They told us we could have a few days before going, so we didn't go in until the 16th. I was glad to get in, but boy, will I be much gladder to get out after the war. This is all right for a kid about 17 to do a few years, but I'm getting older every day and better get out soon. I am 27 now, but this, likes, but this life makes me feel about 57. So John writes that in December 43, the next month, they go into uh, they go into Anzio, and uh, I'll make a long story short here. I think the, the the section on Anzio is about sixty pages in this book. Um, the, the the description of that battle. Um, but uh, what happened is uh, twelve to fourteen German bombers uh, swarmed the Plunket um, for twenty five minutes. Um, the Germans had changed strategy. And we're focusing now in the new year on one ship at a time instead of catching anybody and everybody. And they thought they had a cruiser in their sights. No one's quite sure why these ships, why these dozen planes went at a single destroyer. It was the flagship. <clears throat> it didn't make sense, but those planes stayed on them. By the time it was over, um, the Plunkett had taken out um, three, two confirmed, one probable and, and, and possibly damaged a fourth. And what another thing that we didn't know in my family is that John Gallagher and Bill Alverson in two 20 millimeter tubs were responsible for downing one of those planes. It was a fact that I found in, in Jim Feltz's diary from the war and, and was in the squadron commander's action report. Um, but um, they didn't have all success that day because one of those planes uh, landed a 550 pound bomb on the 1.1 inch gun mount of the Plunkett um, and it completely obliterated that gun and all 12 men who were on that gun and 17 other men who were never found afterward. Um, 29, uh, 24 were, were killed. So there were, there were 53 um, killed um, on the Plunkett, 29 missing in action. They eventually were, were requalified as classified as, as killed in action. Um, and one of them uh, was John Gallagher. This is what the ship looked like after that bomb hit the next day as they were limping into Palermo to make amends. And this is Gallagher's gun tub up here. Um, he was at this gun uh, when he was killed. Um, so that's, that's the, the, the story. And, and just sort of circling back um, to Frank here, um, the story that he's told his whole life, I, I talked about how we, we had the beginning and the middle of it. We never really had the end of it. We knew, of course, what had happened to, to Frank's brother, John. Um, but, and Frank knew it too, because he, he went out and he found the men during the invasion of France. He went back out to the Plunket again, and he found out what happened to his brother. But that was never part of his story. They'd have told him what happened and, and, and what I found out and what's in the book. But that was something that Frank never cared to talk about because it was with Frank as it, as it was, I think, for, for William Faulkner Southerners who, who dreamed about the Civil War that, 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 that maybe, it, you know, Faulkner writes in one of his books, I think it's Intruders in the Dust, that in every Southern boy's heart, um, the flags are still furled and, 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 and the guns are at the ready and Pickett hasn't gone in yet. 
um, that was at the Battle of Gettysburg where the tide turned at last for the, for the South. And I think that it was like that for Frank when he told that story. He told that story because for Frank, um, when he told that story, it was always January 22nd, 1944. And the Plunkett's guns were quiet and uh, they had yet to go into Enzio. So that's it at an hour and two minutes. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to field them. Well, that was super, super compelling, James. Really, thank you very much. Um, and I did uh, fail to mention at the beginning, if anybody has any questions right now, please go ahead and uh, send them to me in the chat. I'll, I'll read them off to James. Um, uh, in the meantime, though, I did have a couple, if you don't mind, of my own. Sure. So um, I'm curious. So uh, did you get a chance to meet any of the, uh, the vets that you got in contact with, like uh, Jim Phelps? I did. I, I, I visited with Jim Phelps um, on two different occasions um, in St. Louis. That picture that I had on the slideshow <clears throat> was a picture of Jim in his hometown of Overland, Missouri. Um, he, um, he and I went on a, on, a, on a quest to see if we could find his old five and dime. And, and, mm. and I, that, that story that, that is, is in the book as its own chapter toward the end it was mm. a really moving day. Most of the book takes place back in the day, but there are two chapters in the book where I jump into the narrative present, once with Jim Feltz in Overland, Missouri, and once with Ken Brown out in um, uh, Denver, Colorado. I went out and visited uh, Ken on two different occasions. And uh, for me, one of the most moving scenes in the book um, takes place with Ken um, at a dinner in a restaurant um, in, uh, in, a, in a little mall in, uh, in Thornton, Colorado. So yeah, I got to know both of them, uh, these men in, in their, these men in repose, right, in their 90s. And, uh, and it was important, I thought, because I learned things about them that the reader needs to know or might want to know about them as young men. There were things I learned about them as old men that informed our understanding of who they were as they were going uh, through this uh, uh, for the Second World War. Mm. Um, you know, and I like to ask this whenever we, we speak to uh, anyone. Um, if, you, if there was anything that surprised you with your research, but it seems like the whole thing was a surprise, right? It seems like it was one surprise after another. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you would like to share about your research, any, any curious bits of information you didn't expect to find where you found them. Well, it's a good question. I, I think that I think that the, the thing that affected me most um, in, in coming out the other side of all this research and coming out the other side of all these these talks I had with these men, these these three men, and there were a number of other men on the Plunkett Skunky Klein, who's still with us at 98 years old in, in Texas and who got his deer. He's still hunting deer. He got a deer in the fall. Um, um, there were a dozen men who'd been on the ship and I talked to them. And, and one of the most moving things um, was that after the war um, and, and after they, they came into their, their senior years, they began to come together in reunions beginning in, in 1981. Hmm. And, and, and the, what I found remarkable was the way that though these men never lost um, though they did lose touch, they never lost grip. In other words, they, they, the, the shared experience that they had on this ship during the war was something um, that I think those of us who have not been through, through something like that, we just don't have access to. And, and when they talked about their reunions, um, I, I was made to understand that, you know, they came together, these men came together on a ship. There were 250 of them on a destroyer. And there's this Social scientists talk about Dunbar's number, which is the maximum number of people that any one of us can have a, a stable relationship with. And it's like 150, 200 men. So there was an opportunity for these men to really come together. So you had these men coming together with the shared experience of war. Um, and you had this ship, you know, pulling them all together. Um, um, it was like a vice around them. And then you had the shared experience of that, that battle at, at Anzio. And, and the blow that they took collectively when that 550 bomb, bomb hit and killed 53 of them 
um, and wounded dozens more, that experience galvanized them once and for eternity. And it gave them this experience of fidelity that would ripple through the rest of their lives. And I always found that incredibly affecting and touching. So. Yeah, um, like you mentioned at the, at the beginning, you know, many, many of us have uh, people in our lives that were veterans. Um, I remember my grandfather and every once in a while, a friend would come up that he served with and it was just this connection that, you know, yeah, you didn't see him have necessarily with anyone else, but, but this guy, cause that was the experience they lived. So right. really compelling, really interesting. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions coming into the chat. Um, so I think we'll just go ahead and leave it there. Thank you very much, James, for your talk right, tonight. Well, thanks very much. It's good to be with you. Thank you everyone for showing up. Take care. Right. Bye-bye. Right. Yes, James, once again, thank you very much. Um, all right. Um, we... Uh, we're all set now. Um, and like I said, we'll put this up. They do put it up on YouTube later. Good. Okay. All right. Very all right. good. Take Have care a good now. Night. All right. Bye-bye.